We visited UCL to talk to Dr. Matthew Piper, who studies the effects of nutrition and diet on healthy aging and increasing lifespan using model organisms such as the fruit fly. My background in science is, is very at the level of fundamental basic research. So, so what, what I mean by that is, is looking into the ways that, for instance, metabolic pathways work in yeast. That was one of my projects in the past. And then how we might produce flavor compounds using yeast for the food industry. And then it sort of moved up, if you like, in the world to, to flies and looking at whole organism studies and how the physiology changes over time in response to nutrition. So my, my interest really is the effect of nutrients on physiology and, and that, that's been my whole biological background. My, the, the way I got into it um, was I was generally fascinated by biology anyway but from all levels of school, schooling right through and I did a science degree which naturally led to a PhD which naturally led to life in the lab. And is this a usual route into longevity research? Or? Not really, well yes and no. So not really in the sense that it wasn't dedicated to longevity research obviously, but the field of ageing concerns so many aspects of physiology. So it, on the one hand it's, it's subcellular you know, metabolic pathways, on the other hand it's genetics and population biology and all sorts of things that actually in the lab here we have such a mix of people from from all, all of these areas trying to contribute to this one subject which is not actually really well understood mm. and so much stuff goes on that influences ageing that we have to have all of these inputs in, into that field. So that's actually one of the features of this lab is that we have so many different backgrounds and specialties all trying to contribute to working out this one problem the physiology and the biology of ageing. We, we ran a series here called the biology of ageing lectures basically within UCL and, and we really tried to draw on people from all across the university to to, to give lectures on, on old age research at, at social levels as well as biological levels. Okay. Yeah. And did you find it interesting or do you yeah, find it better I, to just well, it's always interesting to see uh, see you know other people's perspectives and motivations, especially. And part of of the way we fund our research, of course, is is mainly through public money. So we are responsible for uh, we are responsible to the public for for what we do. And and part of that is applying for money on the grounds that we're working towards a, a treatment for improving old age health of humans. Mm. And, and that has all sorts of social implications, of course. And do you feel the pressure, because you're working with fruit flies, That's right, yeah. and like you said, other model organisms, do you feel the pressure to always immediately infer to the human population, either from the media or from people you talk to, your family yeah. or someone, when you go home and talk to them? Yes, I mean, that, that's everyone's first question, right? I mean, if anyone asks me about skin creams again, you know, I, I yell at them. but yes, of course. the. There's, a, there's the obvious question, which is, okay, you can make flies live longer or worms live longer, so what? I mean, no one's interested in that, really. It's, 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 it has to be a, about ways of constructing research so that we make it as likely to be relevant for humans as possible. And that's, that's, a, that's another fi big feature of the labs here, is that we work between these model organisms and try and look for interventions that work on on all of them so something that works to extend a mouse lifespan and a fly lifespan and a mouse lifespan now you've got something really interesting because it spanned this enormous evolutionary distance so it may well be relevant for humans and, and, and higher organisms. There's two really good examples that we can cite and one is a genetic intervention so it seems well, it, it's apparent that when you lower insulin signaling, so I guess a lot of people are familiar with insulin signaling because it's involved in diabetes, oh. it seems as though there's, there's a gradation of effects. So we, we have normal insulin signaling at one end and complete lack of it at the other end of causing diabetes or, or very profound problems with it causing diabetes. It seems that somewhere in the middle, there may be a range at which a slight reduction of it may actually be benefic beneficial for longevity. Okay. And when we do that genetically in worms and genetically in flies and it has been done genetically in mice as well. It extends the lifespan of all of those three. The place where it becomes interesting for humans 
is that if we look at large scale population studies of uh, people called super centenarians, so people who live very old, beyond 100 years obviously, that they tend to have variations in genes involved in insulin signaling, at least so that's one of the signals that comes out, indicating that this research from the worms may well have relevance to humans, and so that's one case. The other sort of obvious interesting case is there's an intervention known as dietary or calorie restriction. And it, it's known that when you restrict the diet of an animal just a bit, not too much, otherwise they become malnourished and starved, but just a bit, they seem to gain longevity and health benefits with old age. And that works in worms, in yeast actually, worms, flies, mice, in dogs, spiders, everything. And, and most recently, in the liter scientific literature, uh, there's been a study on primates showing that these, these monkeys that are fed slightly less seem to be living longer and have a lower incidence of cancer with old age, for instance. Now, of course, you've got a whole bunch of people now um, trying to apply this to themselves, yes. human beings trying yeah. to um, restrict their calories, and they're yeah. pretty certain it works. They're pretty certain it's one of the only things that mm. we know of that works. Mm. And you get people like Ray Kurzweil and um, mm. also Aubrey de Grey and a few other people who have hit the mm. news who are talking about this. Mm. Yeah. Um, do you feel like there's you can actually infer that yet, or is it...? So I think... What I think about the effect of diet on aging is that is there a, there a, there's a slight confusion between what's been generated from the scientific literature and how, how that's sort of interpreted both within the science and, and also just in the general public. So w the original name for this intervention was calorie restriction. Uh, another name for it is dietary restriction. And, and these are just suitable terms that wrappers for, for describing what you eat. So if you eat less calories, you're bound to be eating less food. Okay. And, and this is really the intervention that we restrict the amount of food the animal eats. But there are instances in the literature where you restrict the amount of food the animal eats and it actually lives shorter or there's no change in lifespan. So what that really tells me is that you can't just say calorie restriction or dietary restriction because that's not enough of an adequate description of what you're doing. You're actually improving the dietary context of the animal. So a balanced diet is, is, is more suitable and uh, a, a moderate amounts of a balanced diet are more suitable. So lots of an imbalanced diet is not good for mm. you. Even a little bit of an imbalanced diet is not good for you. We're talking about a much more complicated problem and I think we run the risk always, uh, and there's, a, there's good reason for that, of oversimplifying and, and perhaps generating a story that doesn't really exist, which is just restrict your calories and you'll live longer. And what's the good reason for that? Well, because, because the problem's complicated. Yeah. Diet, diet has so many aspects to it. We know, I, I think most people are aware of carbohydrates and proteins and, and vitamins, and you know we even need metal ions in small amounts. And, and the the reduction of of the whole diet in total is is a problem uh, potentially if you don't get the balance of each of those nutrients right and that there's a, such a wide range of nutrients getting them right is 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 key apart from the fact that um, a lot of this research on extending healthy lifespans um, to do with calorie restriction is based on model organisms and not human beings yes. um, the other problem there may be with uh, human beings just adopting this wholesale is that it's too, you, you've said, is that it's too complicated, yeah. that many factors involved. Yeah. Um, when do you think we'll reach a point where we'll have a system that allows the ordinary individual to manage their calorie restriction in a way that could extend healthy lifespan? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think we're fighting lots of problems here if you're trying to get people to eat in a certain way because people generally don't eat in that way that's that's ideally suited to them when there are when there's available these uh, highly unusual foods from an evolutionary point of view and that they're high caloric densities and, and so on and they're highly palatable so we've probably evolved to to be consuming these things um, and so when they become available you know we eat generally unhealthy diets so I think that's one problem the, the other aspect of it is because of the complexity of the issue, we're only now, at least in the flies, this is what I work on in particular, uh, 
just getting into the details of which of those particular nutrients have an effect on lifespan and to what extent and you know when you when you raise one up on its own it may have a different effect from when you raise that one and another one up together so that may actually be okay but raising one up on its own is not okay so we're just starting to come to terms with the amounts and the actual balance that are, are critical for this i guess putting a date on it is 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 really tricky we we i can tell you what we're doing now with the flies okay which is that we're looking into the details of of, of which nutrients are important for longevity and and what it seems to be the case is that the protein component of the diet is is very important so if you have a grossly imbalanced diet either towards a lot of protein or a very small amount of protein relative to the other nutrients you the flies become short-lived and and also have uh, disadvantages so they reproduce less for instance Whereas if, you like the protein. If, we, if, we, if we really lower the protein, oh, they reproduce okay. less. Yeah. Uh, whereas if we boost it, they seem to reproduce a bit more. Oh. But, but having an imbalanced diet tends to be what influences the longevity most. And, and now that we know that protein is very critical in determining this longevity phenotype, we're now starting to look at the effects of individual amino acids. So protein is made up of 20 amino acids. And, and they come in a certain ratio. So when you eat meat, there's 20 amino acids in there in different proportions to each other. So even within protein itself, there's a complexity issue, which is how much of each of the subcomponents of protein are important. And we're just starting to find now that if we modulate one or two of them in a certain way, we can actually get beneficial effects o on lifespan and, and on reproduction and, and so all sorts of ways. So we're, we're trying now to come to terms with what they are, and then the reasons for why they're important. Because the reasons why they're important for a fly might be different for why they're important for a human. So if we can understand the reasons, mm -hmm. then we may be able to say, ah, humans have very similar responses in nutrition sense to those nutrients. So we, this may be applicable to humans. Or the reason why this is working is because of this, so now we need to interpret that for humans. And why haven't organisms evolved naturally mm -hmm. to make the right choices? Why aren't the signals well, telling them to do the things that could optimise their lifespan? So I think, yeah, okay, so this is, this is one of the... The evolution of ageing is, is really, was, was really the basis for ageing research in the lab altogether. And it's one of those instances where there's a really clear path from evolutionary biology to the actual bench here. The generally, if if an organism experiences a disease, you tend to sort of purify it from the population because they become sick before they reproduce. But if a disease or a mutation has an effect after the age of reproduction and gets passed on, there's no way of stopping that thing being passed on, right? Because you don't you reproduce before you realise you've got the problem. So that's that's one of the the issues is that ageing could as it could have evolved in that detrimental effects that occur post-reproductively are passed on. A slight extension of that is that if the genes that cause aging are in fact exactly the same as the genes that cause beneficial effects early in life, then you can actually select for them because you become more vigorous early in life, so you select for these genes, and then late in life you suffer detrimental consequences. So aging can evolve in that mechanism. And it, Insulin signaling is actually one of these examples, and this is called antagonistic pleiotropy, so it has two effects that are different at different times in life. And insulin signaling causes an enhancement of growth and reproduction to the flies and long lifespan. So when you mutate, it, well, sorry, uh, enhancement of growth and, and reproduction early in life, but a detrimental effect late in life. So when you mutate it, we find we get smaller flies, so they're, they're dwarfs, they reproduce a lot less and yet they live longer. So there's this balance between early and late life. So that, that's that's the explanation for how our aging could have evolved. There's a lot of um, poetic connection made mm. in the literature between sex and death and yes. you're saying yeah. that it yeah. might actually be uh, scientifically evidenced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and there's there's actually another effect in flies at least that that the amount of resources invested into reproduction 
have been for a long time thought to be directly related to the lifespan of the organism. So you only have a certain, organisms in the wild only have a certain amount of resources that they can deal with. And you either invest them into one thing or another thing. And if you invest it into reproduction, it could come at the cost to looking after yourself. And so you sort of fall apart in the process of committing resources to reproduction. Whereas the other way around, if, if nutrients become scarce, this is, this is perhaps where the explanation for dietary restriction comes from, it's, it's more important for the adult form to look after itself, shut down reproduction and wait until uh, resources come back again or go and find another nutrient source and then at that stage when they're available invest into reproduction and so suffer the consequences later in life. So that, that tends, that's the evolutionary explanation for how those two things are connected. And I assume that when you get, you know, people in your department, in your field are having your parties, <laughs> that you get a bit drunk and you speculate on whether this is true for humans or not. Yeah, um, yeah. And when you're speculating, what do yeah. you speculate? Well, I mean, there's, there's probably good reasons why you could think <laughs> of why having a lot of children might make you live shorter. Um, but, but biologically, I... I'm not aware of a of a good study in humans that really uh, really puts that down. I mean, speculation wise. Is there? I mean, it sounds very complicated for any kind of organism because you know we don't seem to be designed to um, make exact choices and make as yeah. nuanced distinctions when we're going around feeding. Correct. Yeah. Um, so. What would it take for an organism to be able to optimize its diet based on the things we know so far? So even mm. if we find out later that it wasn't the optimum diet, yeah. just based on what we think is now. You um, mean in terms of dietary advice? Uh, no, or I mean in terms of actually following through on it. So, yeah. you know, I mean, you'd really have to control the organism, wouldn't yeah. you? And, um, I think so, yeah. So it, there's some interesting work being done on appetite. And, and feeding behavior in, in all sorts of organisms, but I'm most familiar with the work on flies. It looks like they sample parts of the nutrient spectrum to sort of judge how good quality it is. And based on the quality of it, they'll feed on it. And then if it, if it doesn't meet the biological criteria for what is a good quality diet, they'll go off and find something else. And that, that's evolved for good reasons, and that's because if you monitor just one or two components of the diet, usually all the other nutrients follow, because in the wild you'll never, so flies feed on yeast in the wild, and you never find a yeast that has, you know, enormous amounts of one nutrient, but, but very small amounts of another. And they present a balance of nutrients, so the fly just needs to measure a couple of them, and once it's measured those two, you can be pretty well assured that everything else is coming on. Where it goes wrong is when we start to mess with the food. So when you, when we create an imbalanced diet, and then you think, oh, this is, you know, highly palatable. It's very interesting for the animals. So they get a, they get that nutrient that they're interested in. But at the, but if you've artificially diminished or increased other nutrients as a passenger, they'll get all of these other things, and so suffer the consequences of an imbalanced diet. So the idea that you would have to really control the diet in a sense or increase the spectrum of the ability to taste and smell the nutrients in the food, which is obviously a very difficult uh, thing to do. So I guess getting the, the dietary balance advice correct in the first place is really where the starting point is because once you do that, you get the nutrients you're interested in and you get the right amounts of the passenger nutrients at the same time. And I think I think that's probably where the where the message should be in in preventative sort of you know adopting diets that will be suitable for later on. But there doesn't seem to be much we can do then if we're relying on our evolved tastes in no. order to sense what foods no. um, you know full of the nutrients we need or has the right yeah. balance. And then obviously a lot of, we've got all these new super well not superfoods but yeah. sort of um, you know changed foods, altered foods, that yeah. are sort of taking advantage of those. So I, I guess that's, I mean, everyone knows that, that if you, well, if you eat McDonald's for 30 days, you'll, you know, you'll be really unwell. But well, what about fruit so, so going into Tesco's? I mean, yeah. what would it do? Yeah, I, I mean, the conditions of high degrees of choice, for instance, yeah. Well, what they would go for 
other things that first of all that they smell that smell good to them so they would be attracted towards uh fermenting things so alcoholic beverages and stuff uh, yeah right so. right so or 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 fruit fruit fly or rotting fruit in their case so in that case you would you tend to be drawn towards things that you've evolved to smell or taste that are good so i I agree that we have another problem in that we're faced with this enormous amount of choice of processed foods and, and that's tricky because what we like may not necessarily be the best thing for us. I'm quite interested in, I mean you did allude to it and I think you might even have explained it but I just need to explain a little bit more, sure. which is how did different organisms acquire their taste in the first place or not acquire their taste but how did they decide what, they, what is their diet yeah. and how, how does this process work? I, I, th I think that's that's really interesting. <laughs> so probably, uh, so the way one of the ways we could have evolved is that if nutrients are particularly important. So, like I said, protein is made of twenty amino acids, for instance, and they, in in generally in nature, come in different amounts. So, so there's there's twenty components, and they have different amounts within protein. Characteristically, there are one or two of them that are very low in abundance in nature in general. So you could imagine that one way of assuring that your protein quality is going to be good is that you evolve a mechanism to taste that amino acid. And so, so if you if you taste the limiting one and you can, so if you can taste it, then it starts to taste good. Then the likelihood is that you'll be getting all of the other amino acids as well. And so that's one way that you could perhaps evolve a mechanism of taste that would lead to an appropriate food choice. Okay. Another interesting thing you've alluded to is that so we've we've got in we've got headlines all the time, news headlines, mm. TV headlines saying this you know this new study shows that such and such will extend your lifespan or will make you healthier or and so on. And quite often when you look behind it a little bit or you go mm. down to the third paragraph, it tells you it's based on a couple of studies or one study yes. that was done with fruit, fruit flies or mice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't noticed the worms one yet, but I'm sure it's there. Yeah. Um, are they misleading people? to? Because people are reading those and saying, if I drink wine or, or whatever yeah. it happens to be at that particular time, it will make me healthier. Yeah. Uh, Yes and no. <laughs> so I think I think the reason yes because the headline is a is a vast oversimplification of the research. And I mean, there's I understand the reason for that, right? I mean, no one wants a, a long explanation about how something works. The problem with that is sometimes the answer is complicated, and and there's a reason why scientists work for a long time before they do research and, and while they research it's because the questions they're trying to answer are difficult and take a long time to work out and and when you inevitably in science like most things when you ask a question you think you've got the answer you test it and something else comes out and that means basically we don't understand the problem which means that every question we try to answer we open up more questions which means science is complicated biology is complicated and so I think to a certain extent, the misleading part is that people are oversimplifying science and aren't giving it the chance to be complicated when it has to be complicated. So what would be your criteria for saying, okay, I've done these um, studies on flies mm. and now I can infer it to the human population, what would be your set of criteria? I would want to see evolutionary conservation of the, ph of the phenomenon for what? So, if, if we find a dietary intervention or a theme of how a dietary intervention works on the flies and we test that intervention or that thematic change on mice and it has the same physiological outcomes, now we start to be reasonably confident that across a vast evolutionary distance that this access is something more fundamental about ageing and, and slowing it down that perhaps means it might be relevant for other organisms as well. And this is really what's happened in the, in the literature with, with the calorie restriction intervention, which I prefer to think of as a dietary balance effect, is that people had tested it in yeast, worms, flies, mice, and then launch it up to, to scale up to work and, and test in primates. And, and now that 
it, it looks like it may be relevant for primates. Now we start to think, well, maybe there is a, a, a dietary balance which is going to lessen the effects of some aging-related diseases in humans as well and give, give us a beneficial effect. But understanding exactly what that balance is and, and how much of those nutrients we need, I think, is still, is still out there in the sense that we don't understand those things. We do understand that eating less of a bad diet is, bad for, is good for you, but we don't understand exactly what, what it is that's, a, that's an imbalanced diet. I think that that's really where the research is now. Okay, and you've you've talked about evolution and conservation across species a number of times. Yeah. Um, just give us a quick, in a nutshell, what that means. So, uh, organisms, of course, have have long evolutionary histories, which are individual to themselves. So, a fly, flies experience in life is 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 rotting fruit, finding fruit, trying not to dry out, and that's very different from one of a worm that lives in the soil or or a human or a you know and and so every animal has sort of a, a basic architecture which on which is is sort of built it seems uh, mechanisms to deal with that that individual life history or that evolutionary history and so what we try and say is that if something is conserved between these vastly different animals then perhaps it's accessing something more fundamental about the genetic makeup of that organism and its physiology that might be relevant to all animals and not just these few from a sample of different sections of the evolutionary tree. All right, so just to sort of pin down a few of these points you've made, sure. can you outline some of the similarities between humans, mice and fruit flies or other organisms when it comes to dietary balance effects on lifespans and health? So. The, one of the, the, the topic that I mentioned I'm working on, which is the effect of protein and individual amino acids on dietary, on, on, on longevity and health. In, in flies, we find a very important effect of single amino acid changes on longevity. And in mice, it's also apparent that there are very important amino acid changes that modulate longevity. The Work is a little bit underdeveloped in worms, and that's a technical point of view. Uh, that's a, due to technical reasons. But that that evolutionary conservation from from the flies to the mice is now at a level where we're trying to look at what goes on inside the animal once they ingest these different proportions of amino acids. Because if if that is the same between the worms uh, between the flies and the mice and those mechanisms also exist in other organisms, now we start to say, well, that pathway and accessing that pathway or intervening with that pathway is really what's key here. It's not just the amino acid in the diet. And so then you start to say, well, maybe we can harness that by redressing dietary imbalances by additives to the food or, or, or pills or, I, I don't know, something like this. And I, and I think that's, that's where we're at at the moment, that we have an effect in flies, an effect in mice, and it may be that that's accessing the same processes in both of those animals. And, and so that's where we're at. What well, exactly is a molecular pathway? Yeah. So when we eat food, we, n our body needs to be aware that we've eaten that food because it turns, turns on the, the synthesis of proteins or, or on the storage of fat or turns it off and starts to use fat. So insulin signaling is, is the classic example again. When we eat sugar, our pancreas excretes uh, insulin, and that tells various other tissues like muscle and the liver and so on to take up the sugar from the blood and to use it for various reasons, either to make fat because we've got too much or to use it for energy when we move around and, and things like this. So these molecular pathways, these signaling pathways of nutrients are what I'm talking about when I'm talking about what goes on inside the animal beyond them eating the food. 